O Lord our God, you have brought us into Christian maturity by feeding us mightily. Now, as you fill us mightily, Lord Jesus, give us peace and health through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we talked last week a, a little bit about the fact that moving into maturity is extraordinarily important. So I'd like to look at chapter 6 with you just to chat a little bit more about it. We, we're supposed to leave behind, it tells us, chapter 6 of Hebrews, elemental doctrine of Christ. And the elemental things are oftentimes what I would call a simplistic view. And that we have to move on to maturity. Um, and... Uh, we have to move on by being able to talk about those things which are most important in Christian maturity. For example, uh, whenever you sit down to eat food that is supposed to give you health, probably un unless you are really impulsive, you don't order your dessert first. I mean, life can be more fun if you order <laughs> your dessert first. <laughs> but sugar highs are not always, I think, what everybody is longing for. And 2,000 years ago when this was written, uh, the desserts we're eating today, people wouldn't have understood what in the world they are because much of what we create today is uh, derivative. That is, we have added so many things. They wouldn't have known what processed sugar was, for example. That would have not been a part of their life. And so it says, For land which has drunk the rain that often falls upon it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed. Its end is to be burned. Though we speak thus, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things that belong to salvation. For God is not so unjust as to overlook your work. And the love which you showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness in realizing the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now it goes on to say in verse 13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently endured, obtained the promise. Men indeed swear by a greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he interposed with an oath so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible that God should prove false, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that centers and enters into the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner in our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I have a hunch that as you've listened to this today, that the first impulse you had was to see how it applied to what your experience has been. I mean, that's normal. That's what we do, right? But you do understand that the first people who heard this were doing the same thing. They were saying, how does this apply to my experience? And I think you understand what their experience is. They're now looking at the temple. Now, here's the tough part for them. They're walking to the temple. They have gone to the temple. They have looked at the temple. And they still have in the back of their brain something they heard Jesus say that was getting around a little bit as they're waiting for him to come again. One was, in effect, he said, if you rip this temple down, I'll rebuild it in three days. Oh, they're looking. Hey, this is impossible. How could you rip down a temple like that and rebuild it in three days? Obviously, as it says, they didn't get the kind of temple he was talking about, namely his body. Now let's go to the next one. When he was weeping over the children... Remember, when he looked at, to, at the women who were weeping, he said, Weep not for me, but for your children. 
Uh, now, there is a church on the Mount of Olives that is called Dominus Flevit. Dominus Flevit. And on the Mount of Olives, it looks down into the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's there that we believe that Jesus wept. Uh, because it's, it's uh, Jesus' tears. And the church, a little more modern kind of church, I mean only in the past hundred plus years, there have been many churches there before, but the, the most recent one is shaped like a teardrop. It's really very touching. But it has a completely uh, glass uh, behind. In other words, the, behind the altar, the whole wall is glass. So when you stand at the altar or where you're in the pews, and you're looking through that glass, you're seeing the whole city of Jerusalem. So you're getting to see why Jesus was weeping and what he was weeping about. But the most incredible thing is the focal point that you have is the temple. Now let's go to the next step. It was in 70 AD that the temple was destroyed. So if the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, most people hearing this, it's not all connecting. Mind you, not everything's connecting. But there are some people who after 70 AD are doing a lot of ahas. Oh, his body. Oh, the temple. Oh, will it ever be rebuilt? For those of you who have been to the Holy Land, and you have, I have taken some of you to the temple uh, area, and it's certainly around the base, and I have taken you to see some of the uh, stones that are right outside the walls. I mean, we're talking about not something that can be moved very easily. So the question that we have to ask is, how is it that they even ripped that thing down so quickly? I mean, what? You know, today there would be a work order, three <laughs> estimates, a project manager. Then there would be a meeting. And then they'd sit around and talk about it. And then they, in a few months, would try and figure out who hadn't done it. And on and on, the whole process would be looked at. And the, and the place wouldn't have been knocked down. But the, when the Romans destroyed it, remember, they, they were wanting to really destroy it. And they even renamed the place, didn't they? Jerusalem, the name Jerusalem was abolished. And the Romans renamed it Elio Capitolino. And uh, kind of the top of, the, uh, of the, what you see, the skies and so on. So th this is gone. They're trying to establish themselves more fully. And now we have the epistle to the Hebrews, which is saying to them, you've lost your faith. You're losing your hope in the words of Jesus. Didn't he promise all these things to you? Didn't he feed you on something? And now you're going back and you're arguing over elemental doctrine. It's a little bit like going back and saying, uh, when I was in line, ready to go to communion, somebody bumped into me. Oh. Oh. Oh, I see. And uh, w w w what's the problem there? Did that change the bread and the wine from being the body and blood of Christ? See, going back to elemental unnecessaries, that's what people tend to cling to. When people are upset about things, they usually cling on to things that wouldn't mean a blessed thing. I was talking to a man today who's claiming he's been trying to get hold of me for three days. So I did my best to try and talk with him on the way here today. And he's going on about things that were upsetting him and about what's upsetting him about some national realities that he kind of hopes that I will work on. And as I listened to him carefully, I said, you know, I just want to ask you a question. If you were down in a pit and um, you have the conviction you do about the jurisdiction you're in, and you're down in the pit and you were hungry and you needed to get out of the pit, and um, a... Uh, a man came over to you and extended his hand. Is the first question you would ask, 
are you of the jurisdiction that I trust? <laughs> are you a part of the true church? <laughs> no, let me ask you some basic questions. And the problem is that people spend so much time with non-life-threatening matters that they make them into life-threatening matters. And a person down in the pits, you know, they, they just want somebody with enough of an arm to pull them out and enough food to feed them to make them feel better. And, of course, this is what you have with the parable Jesus gives about the Good Samaritan. I mean, here, here's this poor fellow all beat up. The priests are too busy to feed him or help him out because they don't want to be late for mass. So they keep on, you know, walking along. And, uh, and then this Samaritan comes. And I think all of you know how, what the Jews think about Samaritans, don't you? Well, if you don't, let me just explain a couple things. First of all, the Samaritans worship God on a... A different mountain than in Jerusalem. Maybe that was safer for them <laughs> in 70. <laughs> and they wear a different type of kafia, um, that is the head covering. And they also only uh, work with the Torah, which would be the first five books of the Bible. Well, let's see how, let, to say it with me Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Deuteronomy, and the Jews, by and large, by then, had already taken on some of the prophets, whereby you hear Jesus brought up in the Pharisaical school, who says, on these two commandments hang all the and the prophets. So that means more than just the first five. But nonetheless, that's where Jesus went to be able to do a number of things, including the woman who was at the well. And you may remember she was a Samaritan. And already we remember that Jesus broke some of the laws. He talked to her. She, uh, the water that she's offering comes out of the well, which is still water. And he wants to give her living water. Jew can't offer that to the Samaritans. Now you're ready to get back to what their biggest problem was years ago, which helped create some of it? Intermarriage. Intermarriage. They, they kind of messed up the bloodline. And that was more important than anything else. Which led, at least during one rebuilding attempt, when the Samaritans offered to go rebuild the temple, the people in Jerusalem to say, we'd rather have our temple in shambles than to have them come and help us. <laughs> so now let's go back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so here comes this man running towards the man who's down below who's been all beat up. Now if you have been brought up to believe about the Samaritans, everything that has ever been said about the Samaritans, and you see a Samaritan coming to you and you're down in the pit, you can imagine what some of your first thoughts are going to be. Whoops, looks like I'm getting finished off very quickly. Because everybody knows that Samaritans, fill in the blank, hate Jews. Going to kill us. Or he's going to come down here and see if I have anything left in my bag. And he'll steal it. On and on and on. Now, you remember what the Samaritan does. Gets him, carries him, feeds him, takes him to the inn says at the end, uh, please take care of him. I'll be back later in a time frame. And if there are any more bills to be paid, I'll pay the bills when I get back. Now this happens along a snake path. So where it happens is quite fascinating because it means that there were a lot of robbers who were along the way anyway, who hid behind these little corners and crevices. So this poor man was right out there, and he was beaten up pretty soundly, as, as you see in the parable. In fact, just for fun, nobody's willing to really say much about it, because you do understand this is a parable, right? And you do understand that a parable is truthful in what it teaches. 
but don't start grading it on the basis of whether it happened precisely that way because Jesus wasn't giving us a verbatim of a story, I mean of a, an event that occurred, he's giving us truth and he teaches through parable, even though that annoyed people from time to time. So you do recall what happened uh, to this day perhaps, a few of you, is I took you past uh, uh, a kind of uh, a Jewish 7-Eleven uh, called the, uh, uh, the Good Samaritan Inn. <laughs> and people stopped there and got some water and orange juice and blood orange juice and all these other sorts of things. So uh, let's just say occasionally people capitalize even on parables. However, what you capitalize on is the fact that you now know the difference between Jesus being the temple and also you because as I indicated in the one gospel about the, uh, the um, faces, the jars, you, you are the treasure that's inside the vessel even though this earthenware might not be something that you'll sell except in an antique store because it's old, not because it's pretty. And so that means that you and I are temples of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the reasons why we treat each other with total respect even if we don't like what somebody's doing. And that's because we're looking at temples of the Holy Spirit. And even though we may need to be corrected and we need to correct ourselves from time to time, once again, I have to always take us back to what I've said before. Uh, people just aren't perfect. You know, I, apparently I didn't get it right the first time because I've had to be ordained three times. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's it. I mean, he's only had to been ordained twice, and you've only had to be ordained once, so I, I guess you two are be doing better than I've done. <laughs> By the way, everybody, I'm pointing at a deacon and pointing at a priest. But here I am. And in each instance, uh, I changed. Each of those ordinations changed my heart, changed my gifts, changed the th my responsibilities, just the way it is. But it doesn't mean that I was given the gift to perfection each time as ordained. Uh, in fact, uh, I said to somebody one day, they were saying how, it was years ago, they were saying, you're under such pressure, how do you handle it? I said, you mean apart from grace and prayer? Said, yeah, how do you kind of handle all the pressure that you are under? And I said, I don't know. I said, first of all, it's always important for me to remember whose problem it is. It's God's problem. Yeah, and he must trust me a lot because he's asked me to help him out here <laughs> and to do some things on his behalf. But I, and I want you all to think about that for just a moment. If you ever come across somebody who's a troubled person, everybody out there in your parish or in your family or in your, wherever you go, uh, your organization, I had somebody call me two days ago to complain about the rotary. I mean, whatever group it is, it's, uh, there, there's imperfection. And in that imperfection, we recognize that only God is perfect. But here's the thing that you have to understand, is if God allowed troubled people into your life, he must trust you. It's not his saying to you, this is your punishment, I'm giving you only troubled people. God only gives troubled people to people who know what to do with them. Because many troubled people would go someplace and they'd be given, you know, you're out sign. Uh, they'd, they'd be ostracized. They, they would be mistreated. They wouldn't be appreciated. But God sends people with troubles to places where he knows that the people will take care of each other and not treat people like they're troubled people. It's like when I worked with boys at St. Francis Boys Homes. I had to explain to people that there was a difference between bad boys and boys who did bad things. And not all my boys uh, were bad. 
Now, I had a few of my boys who were there for murder. I mean, it's true. I did. Uh, I had boys who had done every kind of uh, thing you could imagine, from arson. I remember one of the ones that broke my heart the most was a boy whose dad was a priest who was sent there. And his dad was a priest in a very well-known parish, and they had a processional cross that had jewels in it, because it's not uncommon in some churches, at least it used to be, where people would will their jewels to the church, and then the church would put those jewels in the chalices, for example, or they would put them into, if it were amethyst, they'd put it into the bishop's mitre, or in some instances what they would do is, if they were large enough, they'd put them into the processional cross that they would use on special occasions. Well, this boy took the processional cross and he walked from the back of the church up to the altar and smashed the processional cross into bits. And of course, uh, eventually what that meant was he was arrested. Eventually what it meant was he had to go to court. Eventually what it meant was that uh, he was given an alternative placement and we were the alternative placement. But what happened is neither the dad nor the judge were willing to ask the underlying questions. Yeah, why? And who are you really angry with? Well, he was angry with God because God took his dad away from him a lot. Because his dad was a priest. And he was angry with his dad because he could never get his attention. But guess what? He got his attention that day. And, and that's the reason why so very often... Um, when I would be reviewing all the case histories before we would receive the boys and I'd go down everything down the list. Then I'd go through their MMPIs, you know, that's one of the psychiatric tests. Then I'd go through the Zondi, another psychiatric. Then I'd go through 16PF. Then I'd go through if they were using projective testing. Then I'd go through and, and see what kind of responses to Rorschachs and whatever it is. We had different batteries of tests, so I'd review all that. And then I would get to the bottom part where I'd see that his dad was a priest. Then I would gulp hard and say, another tough case. Because I've got to get underneath some layers here. The layers of anger, a la the layers of feeling betrayed, the layers of never being important enough. Because in many instances, uh, clergy children feel as if they really uh, aren't as important to their dad as the people in the parish are. This is what happens. How come when I call you dad, uh, you're not available, but when your people in the parish call you, you always have time for them? You know, that's what they oftentimes would ask. Now, I never fell into that trap. And I think all of you have recognized this. Is not, this is, for all of you out there, this is a chance to, to tell you a little bit about how this all works through. And, and this is very important uh, to Hebrews, and I'll explain it to you. But every night at 9 o'clock, um, because my, the rectory was one sidewalk away from the church, and at 9 o'clock I had my alarm set. And if I was in the middle of a bishop's or a vestry meeting or my other numerous meetings, because I, I had meetings every night of the week. I mean, it was just a busy parish. Every night of the week there was some kind of a meeting. I would go over to the rectory, I would kneel down in front of the prayer area, which was like a little altar, say prayers with Joe and the three children, and then I would go back to the meeting. But some nights I wasn't there. And on those nights I would be in a bar, getting a drunk out of, out of a bar, or in jail trying to free somebody, or uh, being called by the police to go into a standoff where you know there were people with guns, all those things, the normal things that happen in, you know, rough places. And, and Joe would really be depending upon me to be there to pray with the children. Here's what Joe would say. She would say, aren't we proud of Daddy? Let's pray for Daddy because Daddy is doing something that nobody else can do right now. I can't do it. You can't do it. The police can't do it. Only Daddy can do that right now because Daddy's a priest. And because Jesus has given Daddy the grace to be able to go and do that. So aren't we proud of Daddy and let's pray for him right now and let's pray for the people he's taking care of. And that's the reason why you see that I have three children who are in the church and are active in the church. 
and are not angry with God or angry with me. And the other reason was because Job provided a Christian environment at home that was a safe haven. When they came home, they didn't encounter the problems of the church in the rectory because they weren't discussed there. She provided a safe place for me and for the children so that when we entered there, we could have a kind of sanctuary. Well, it's the bleeding over that is oftentimes problematic in people's lives. And in the epistle to the Hebrews, these people are doing too much bleed over. Because there's groups of people who are not saying, aren't we proud of daddy? They're saying, aren't we upset with Jesus? Because he hasn't come back yet. And aren't we upset with the apostles who told us he was coming back? And aren't we upset? Wait a minute. No, we're not upset with the Jews because we're Jews. And because maybe the ways we were doing things before Jesus came were really the right way to do things. Because my life's been miserable ever since I started following Jesus. I lost some of my family. I have to live in a, a not-so-nice house now. Uh, I'm not making as much money. I'm being discriminated against. I feel like people don't really like me. My life is in a tough place. Oh, okay. Gee, so let me get this straight. You want more than Jesus. Okay, got it. Okay. Remember Jesus said, if you, you want to follow me, listen, look at the fine print. He says, foxes have their holes, but the Son of God has no place to lay down his head. So why it is that Christians think that when you become a Christian, or you become more committed to him that your life gets better is still a mystery to me. But it is, in fact, what many people believe. And I think in that case, they ought to follow somebody else rather than Jesus, somebody who's had a great career, <laughs> who lived longer than the age of 33, because apparently they're not interested in the kingdom of heaven they're interested in the kingdom of the world. So if we don't get in this world what we want, we should never be surprised. And that's what the epistle to the Hebrews is touching on here. Now you're kind of fretting over nonsense. And now you're getting all upset about these elemental things, to use their word. And you're forgetting the promises of Jesus because they're not so important anymore. Or to put differently, as I've been trying to say lately just to get us thinking more about it, you're more interested in churchianity than you are in Christianity. You know, you, yeah, good job. You can name the seven sacraments. Now name the, name the twelve apostles. You know, why not? Why can't it be both? Why does it have to be either or? But that's because... Living within the context of the church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, means incorporating in 2,000, even more, plus years of Jesus. That's why the church is his body, not some building somewhere. That's why the church is the bride of Christ, not some institution. Because if I were to judge whether I'd be in the church on the basis of people, I'd probably opt out. I'd opt out. I'd go look around and see if there's something better going on. But the problem is many churches today really think of the church as an institution. They don't think of the church as the body of Christ. And that's wrong thinking according to the Bible. And that's what the epistle to the Hebrews is trying to say here. Uh, remember this, that if a person in Jerusalem comes up to me today and they say, I'm a Jew, here's several things that might happen. I might say to them, which synagogue you, do you go to? And they might respond by saying, I'm an atheist. What? thought you said you were a Jew. I'm an atheist. Do you realize that there's some kibbutzes right now that won't have synagogues in them because they're atheist kibbutzes. You know, the kibbutzes are those communities. One place recently was voting on whether to have a rabbi come in, and they said, no, we don't believe. Why would we want a rabbi to come in? So 
when you ask a Jew what it means to be a Jew, the question you have to ask, is it ethnicity? Is it religion? Is it nationality? It, it, it's all or none. I mean, really. So, but when I ask somebody if they're a Christian, they might say yes, because I believe in Jesus. Where, well, name your church. Well, I don't have a church. Oh, and you're a Christian. So we live in a country now where there are some Christians who believe they can be Christians without having a church which means they have a philosophical predisposition and that's good that's better than nothing by the way <laughs> but they don't understand what the epistle to the hebrews and all of the new testament is talking about and all of the church fathers are talking about and that is you have to have the church in fact one saint says if you don't have the church as your mother you can't have god as your father isn't that an interesting statement? And it's one that many people today would disagree with. But what the saint is really trying to say is, you have to have both. You have to have both. And that's because there has to be a place out of which you live the Christian faith. Now, if any of you are seminary professors, sorry, I'm doing my best here. Here it is. Uh, with the exception of the shoulder house, where every faculty member is in a parish functioning as a priest in charge or a vicar on Sundays. You go to many seminaries and you discover that the faculty members only attend a church on Sunday and don't work in a church. So how in the world can you teach men in seminary about living in the church if it's all theory without having had practice? It's like I said to a man, the man who called me this morning talking about a about priesthood and about the fact that the thing that he is discovering that is really hurting his church the most is that they're getting clergy who have no seminary backgrounds or no in seminary training and he's saying that he just keeps watching the um, the overall life of the parish shrinking in terms of formation and I just asked him a question. I said, would you go to a barber who read a book about haircuts? <laughs> and would you go to a cardiologist who, who watched a few videos about heart surgery? So on YouTube, no. Just because you can use the vocabulary and tell somebody how to do something does not mean that you've been in the trenches with it. And that's where it is with the epistle to the Hebrews. These new folks that are being addressed in the epistle to the Hebrews are getting information and it's not squaring up. And some of the people that they had gotten the best information from are dying and Jesus hasn't returned. So this epistle is saying that's a pretty bad signal as to why you ought not to be practicing your faith. You need to practice your faith by getting in the middle of it and stop drinking milk and start eating some solid food. So I'll leave you with just a few thoughts to summarize that. Sometimes the only way we can do teaching is by having a common vocabulary. Some of you in this room today have vocabulary that's been developed in your education and in your experiences. I'm looking at several nurses. I'm looking at several people who are trained in very specific areas. Some who uh, understand God's creation but may understand animals a hair more when it comes to that. Uh, some who understand teaching and understand children. And there's a common vocabulary that you have. And you also recognize that when you use that vocabulary in some groups, you're forcing people to go to a, a dictionary because they don't know what you're talking about. So the difficult thing about preaching is finding out what the common vocabulary is so that you don't overwhelm people with terms that make you look condescending. But it's also a matter of finding a common vocabulary that will engage people in learning more. Example. I wish everybody here would look very carefully at the concept in ascetical theology of duties of state. 
If you look very carefully at duties of state in the whole realm of the spiritual life and in the whole realm of ascetical theology, all of you, I guarantee, will start feeling better about yourself. And if you want to know the easiest way to find that, don't look it up in the Wikipedia. <laughs> but borrow that book that's in the library called A Lifetime Road to God, written by Bishop Donald J. Parsons, the sixth Bishop of Quincy. There's about five of them in there. They're little books. Borrow them, take them home, read them, and it'll make you feel better about yourself because you're going to realize and I'm talking, sorry about that, I don't, know, I don't know who you are, but I'm looking at all of you right now, and I'm telling you, I know all of you here, and you're pretty terrific, every one of you. And every one of you is dazzling me regularly. But you don't even know how you're dazzling me. <laughs> so I want you to go and read The Lifetime Road to God, and then I want you, at another time, we'll sit down and we'll discuss it, and then by then I want you to say, how do you think you've been dazzling me? Because it will tell you in there that you understand such things as duties of state. You're understanding some things such as the purgative way of praying, the illuminative way of praying, the unitive way of praying. You know the difference between curse, discursive prayer. You'll know the difference between meditation and just having a happy thought. And... and, and Meditation doesn't mean going into the shower and taking a shower and thinking about the, you know, how nice it is outside. But there's a discipline that goes with it. Read that book. Get back to me. That's what the church has been teaching for 2,000 years. And that's why you need to have the church as your mother. Because mama knows what she's talking about. Let us pray. Well, Lord, our God, we are grateful for the church, and we thank you for the epistle to the Hebrews. It keeps telling us to go back into the basis of that family, the church, so that we may be fed and nourished through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.